Thank you very much, Billy, and welcome to everybody on the call today. Of all the speaking I do, of all the classes I do and the presentations I make, the one that is near and dearest to my heart is this one uh, about under-earning and how attorneys under-earn. Um, I just have declared war on attorney under-earning, and I am thrilled to have you on the call today because I'm going to give you some great information here some help for you in your practices, and if you are currently under-earning, I'm hopeful that after spending an hour with me today, we're going to turn that around, and you're going to start earning the kind of money that you need to be making. So my background is, uh, as Billy said, I've been consulting with solo and small practices now for 24 years. I have been in the legal field for many more years than that, and I have come to the conclusion over the years that there is simply not a law firm in this country of any size that could not be making more money. It's all about the choices that the individuals uh, in those firms are making. In a solo or small practice, you are reaping the rewards or the uh, losses of the choices that you make in a large firm. You may be sharing in the rewards or the losses because of the decisions somebody else has made. So you're in a much better position to turn things around here. So let's start out here by taking a look at exactly what is under-earning. What do I mean by that? And simply put, it's earning below your, poten your potential or less than you need. Below your potential or less than you need. And some symptoms of under-earning that I've noted in my clients uh, include not living the life you want, not being able to provide the lifestyle you would like for your family, not making enough money to cover your basic needs, not having enough money each month to be able to save for emergencies or retirement, not being able to give your staff the raises or bonuses they deserve, living in deprivation, not being able to do the things with the business that you would like, and constant stress about money. So if you identify with any of those, then you are in the right place today. Um, I have seen examples of those in one, one or more examples of those, I think, in almost every law firm that I've worked with. And there are fixes, there are cures for these things, and a way for you to overcome these. So listen up today, take good notes. The handout materials are pretty good and will help you as well. And after this call, uh, you will be receiving a set of the slides, uh, you have got the handouts, and you'll have a link to a recording of this program so you can go back and hear this again if you uh, had questions or missed something. So let's move along. Billy, next slide please. Uh, under earning really is a result of choices that you make and these choices can keep you earning below your potential. So the first uh, choice or the first under earning mode here is passive under earning. And that's choosing not to do something or failing to do something that would have resulted in you making more money. Some examples of passive under-earning would include failing to raise your rates, not spending money on software or equipment that would make you more efficient and productive, not tending to your marketing, not billing for all of the time worked, procrastinating on tasks, and not controlling the length of your initial consultations. The second type of under-earning is active under-earning, and this is about knowingly doing something that will cause you to under-earn, under accepting a client whom you believe will not be able to pay your fees, providing excessive pro bono services, discounting your fees, writing off time, handling certain administrative or non-billable tasks yourself that could be outsourced, such as bookkeeping responsibilities or payroll or bidding a project low to beat your competition. So some examples of the two types of under-earning here. Now, I want to give you a quick self-quiz here. You're all on your phones. Nobody's going to see what you're doing and, and know your answers here. But I want you to grab a piece of paper and just make a tick mark uh, every time you would answer yes to uh, what I'm saying. I'm going to give you a list of statements that will help uh, identify whether or not you are truly an under-earner and maybe help you identify some of the issues that are causing you to under-earn. So I'm going to run through these really quickly. Make your tick marks every time you identify with the statement I've just made. All right, first one. I often give away my services, and that would be pro bono work, not billing for all of the time worked, 
volunteering, answering questions for free on the telephone, or giving free initial consultations. Uh, number two, my initial consultations almost always run over the time allotted, but I don't charge more for the extra time. Number three, raising my fees causes me such stress and fear that I only do it every few years. Number four, I regularly discount my fees to encourage prompt payment. Number five, sometimes I feel that I'm not worth what I charge, so I write off part of my time. Number six, I don't record my time contemporaneously for either hourly or flat fee work. Number seven, I let my accounts receivable become 90 days or more past due before I take action. Number eight, I continue working for clients who aren't paying me. Number nine, talking with clients about money is uncomfortable for me. Number 10, I waive my advance fee deposit if a potential client can't afford it. Number 11, I have time management issues. Number 12, I am good at self-sabotage. And this would include accepting clients who are unable or unlikely to pay my fees, not setting goals and developing action plans to reach them, taking cases I'm not qualified to handle, billing irregularly, not doing focused marketing to attract my ideal client, etc. Number 13, my debt level is high, I have very little savings, my retirement account is underfunded, and I'm not clear on where my money goes. Number 14, I don't really know how much I actually earn until I see it on my tax return. Number 15, I continually put the needs of others before my own. Number 16, I'm often worried about money. And number 17, I fear for my financial future. So if you were honest in your self-appraisal here, you probably have a few tick marks here. And again, those uh, statements, that. Um, by the way, the handout material has that list in there. So you don't have to try to remember what the tick marks related to. Um, it's in the handout materials. I gave you a chapter out of my book, on, um, and the chapter was on attorney under earnings. So you can go back and identify what your particular issues are. So either consciously or unconsciously, too many attorneys are making the choices that cause them to under earn. Uh, <clears throat> So where does that come from? Well, under-earning begins here. It begins in our little brains, in the gray matter. And I can help you develop systems, uh, procedures, set up policies and practices in your firm. I cannot address the gray matter between your ears. You're going to have to do the work there. And that's going to involve turning around your thinking on some, uh, some issues. So let's look at... Uh, some of the reasons behind under-earning. Uh, and they're kind of all over the place. You may identify with one or more of these. Um, but uh, the first one here, uh, Billy, I'm sorry, I meant to say next slide. Uh, and that one should show the head with the brain, the gray brain, and then let's go to the next slide, number five. This is the living in a money fog. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I made an offer to everybody on my mailing list that I would do a free uh, billing rate review for them because I just see over and over and over and over that attorneys are not getting their billing rates right. They just pick a figure out of the air or look what the competition is charging or what sounds reasonable to them, and that's not doing it for you. That, that's not the way to set the billing rate. There's the actual formula. So I offered this to my list, and a number of attorneys took me up on this. And by the way, I'm going to make that same offer to everybody on this call. Uh, and, and it would be fine with me if every one of you took advantage of that. I don't care. Uh, this is, again, my war on attorney under earning here. You have my email address. Uh, should have it in the handout materials and a phone number either way. So give me a holler. We need about... 20, probably 25 minutes to go over your information. But in figuring out the billing rate, I was astonished that every single one of these attorneys who contacted me with questions about if their billing rate and was it correct were unable to tell me basic things like how much money they wanted to earn. They couldn't tell me what their overhead was. Um, they didn't they didn't have specifics. They didn't understand what their realization rate was. And these are all important component parts of this formula to figure out what your hourly rate needs to be. So this is what I call living in a money fog. And uh, Karen McCall, uh, who has the financial recovery 
uh, Institute in the Bay Area um, wrote a book, Money Minder Financial Recovery Workbook. And she says, if you are vague about your money situation or habits, or if you feel that you have no control over your money, it's very difficult to connect your money behaviors with their consequences. And it is virtually impossible to take concrete steps towards change. So the first thing here is getting out of this money fog and understanding the money. You have to know exactly. When I ask attorneys, you know, what do you need to take out of your business? They're always very vague. Nobody ever says, I need to take out uh, $83,500 a year. They, it's always something like, well, I don't need a lot to live. I don't have a high lifestyle. Um, you know, I'm pretty frugal. And that's vague. And that's why you're having money problems, because you don't understand the money and you're not tapping into actual numbers. So clue number one here is you're living in a money fog and you need to come out of that. Next slide, please, Billy. Uh, for some people, it's a matter of low self-esteem. I'm sorry. Sometimes we don't see ourselves as others do. Um, I was working with an attorney a few years ago. If ever anybody had accurate time records, it was this fellow. He recorded every single minute of every day, including things like pouring coffee, staring out the window, um, you know, reading, replying to emails, uh, uh, going to get envelopes, whatever. He recorded every single thing. When I looked at his bills, across the board, every single bill, every single time entry on those bills was discounted by about 30%. And he would show that, and it would say, you know, I did this, blah, 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 whatever, for three hours, and then under that, no charge, one hour. On every single entry on every bill, it wasn't 30% off the total bill, it was each entry. And I asked him why he does that. I said, if anybody had accurate time records and you had full confidence that you had indeed worked the time you're billing, it would be you. So I'm not clear on why, you're, why you discount all of this. And he looked at me for a moment. He said, I guess I just don't see the value of my services. Um, and it broke my heart. The fellow had practiced for almost 20 years. He had an excellent reputation in his community. And he was a chronic under-earner because of low self-esteem. Um, and the thing is, by doing that and showing these discounts month after month after month on the bill, his clients began to believe he wasn't worth the money. Because they're looking at this and thinking, well, he, he knows he's overbilled. He knows he took too long on this. That's why he's marking this down. They're not looking at this as poor self-esteem. They don't know he has poor self-esteem. So sometimes that is the cause. Next slide, Billy, please. Sometimes it's this idea that Prince Charming will save me. And Prince Charming can come in any variety of forms. It might be you know, hoping to win the lottery. Uh, I had two friends who were getting close to retirement, and they hated their jobs. So both of them for about the last two and a half years of employment, every week bought a lottery ticket with the hope that they would win the lottery and they would be able to quit sooner. They didn't win the lottery. They worked out there two and a half years. The moment they retire, they stop buying lottery tickets. So that was their Prince Charming. Sometimes it's an inheritance. You're hanging on there for an inheritance and you think, well, this will save me. Uh, if I could just hold it together till Aunt Sadie dies, you know, then I get half a billion dollars and I'll be on easy street. Uh, an attorney that was in a class I did a few years ago, it was with a monthly class, every month he would come to class and tell us how he was hanging on, hanging on. He had co-counseled on a case, contingent case, uh, with an attorney on the other side of the state. And when this finally came in and, and they got their award and all that, he would be in line for about $125,000. And that's all that was keeping him going, was this thought that as difficult as things were now, he was going to get $125,000, and that would take care of things. Now, while he was waiting, he lost his office. He had to fire all of his staff. Um, he lost his home. He had, had gone through a divorce, uh, and it kept the home, but had to give that up because he couldn't afford it ended up living in a studio apartment, hanging on, waiting for this $125,000. Came to class one time and really dejected and not talking. And we finally got him to open up. And it turned out co-counsel had missed a critical date. The other side filed for default and case was done. 
uh, and no recourse, no $125,000. He ended up um, ultimately applying for a job in a small island in the South Pacific because he couldn't find anything local. He was too senior for law firms to hire. Um, and that was his Prince Charming. He just kept waiting for that money and doing nothing else to help himself. So sometimes that's what's hanging us in there. And if Prince Charming is your saving grace here, you need to think about plan A. Prince Charming would be plan B. But while you're waiting for Prince Charming to save you with money, what, what can you be doing to help yourself? Okay, next slide, Billy, please. Sometimes it's to punish someone else. And I saw this a couple of years ago. One of my clients, um, a woman, a woman attorney, excellent attorney, um, was having real issues in making herself do her work, do her marketing, get her billing out. She was billing um, infrequently. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and it turned out she was doing this because she had elderly parents and her siblings were looking to her to support them, to support the parents. And because she had the, they thought, the best paying job or the best opportunity for money, she resented like heck being put in that position. So subconsciously, she made sure she didn't make more money than her siblings. Uh, so that they would still share the cost of taking care of the parents. So in that case, she was under earning to basically punish the siblings uh, for expecting her to take on a responsibility she thought they should all be sharing. All right, next slide, Billy, please. Sometimes we under earn out of a fear of giving something up, uh, losing friends. And that sounds silly, but if you have friends who are all on a similar uh, economic <coughs> level as you, um, sometimes there's the fear that if all of a sudden you're making some decent money, you're not going to have those friends any longer. They're going to be suspicious of you and jealous of you and, and whatever. So that is a very real concern for some people. Sometimes there's a raised expectation of oneself. Um, if I start earning more money, then I'm going to have to maintain that level, and I don't know if I could do that. Uh, some people fear not being able to handle the money. We hear the stories all the time of the people who win lottery, huge lottery payoffs, and it destroys their lives. And uh, some people fear that, not being able to handle the money. So people fear that the money will be taken away from them. Um, maybe they have high debt or garnishments or uh, you know something like that that's um, hanging over them, and um, they're uncomfortable with the idea that they might be making more money, but they're not going to get to hang on to it. So next slide, Billy, please. You need to think, what is your fear around earning more money? Now, it's interesting, an interesting situation a few years ago. Uh, I was in Traverse City, Michigan doing a CLE, and I came in a day or two early and found that there had been miscommunication in publicizing this program, and the word really hadn't gotten out very well. So one of the attorneys in the steering committee for the program and I put together a flyer and I got in the car and drove around to law firms in Traverse City and delivered the flyers and invited attorneys to come join our program. <coughs> I went into one firm and the attorney was getting ready to leave the office talking to his assistant and I walked in and stood kind of off in the corner. He looked up and said, yes, can I help you? And I said, I just want you to drop this flyer off. And I handed it to him and he looked at it and it was about um, attorneys under Ernie. And uh, he looked at it and he literally shuddered and he said, oh, I don't want to make more money. And uh, he said, if you make more money, you just pay more taxes. There's no point in killing yourself. You're just going to lose it to the IRS. So I thought he was kidding, but 
Uh, he talked a moment more, and I realized he wasn't kidding. Uh, he was content where he was, and I looked at his assistant, and I thought, I wonder if she's content where she is, uh, because she can't earn more money because he's not earning more money. So really take a deep look inside and see if you have some fear around earning more money and identify that. That's the only way you're going to start working through that and, and get that out of the way here. Uh, next slide, Billy, please. You need to consider what under-earning benefits you. And it may be that your current practice uh, provides your comfort zone. It may not be doing what you want it to do. It may not be providing for you the way you want it to. But you know it. It's comfortable in that you know it. And you don't have to work uh, super hard or make changes or whatever because you know what to expect from it. You know, psychologists tell us all the time that there's a payoff in everything we do. Even negative behavior has a payoff, and sometimes that payoff is enough to uh, promote that negative behavior. Uh, and I'm not saying that the unearning payoff for you may be um, uh, a strong negative here, but there is something about under-earning that is benefiting you. It may be reinforcing your thoughts about yourself. Um, it may be um, holding on to your position, you know, in the local community. Um, you know, I'm not one of the, the big high-priced law firms here. I have uh, a modest firm and, and modest needs and modest uh, fees and, and all of this. So dig, dig down and see how your under-earning benefits you. Um, Billy, next slide, please. In my work with attorneys over the years, uh, I, I don't, I'm not working with them on necessarily under earning, but when I get a call from an attorney, nine times out of ten, the first thing out of their mouth is, I'm just not making enough money. I'm working hard. We have clients. I'm just not making enough money. So. In effect, much of my work centers really around helping attorneys um, change their practices, develop their practices to the point where they're earning what they need to earn and earning what they deserve. So whether or not they understand that they are under earning if they tell me they're not making enough, we go back to what the definition is, earning less than your potential or earning less than your needs. And that's basically what has driven them to call me. So over the years, I have identified um, more than 30 different behaviors that cause attorneys to under-earn. And I'm going to share with you uh, some of them here. I'm not going to do all 30, but I'm going to share the ones that I see most commonly. Uh, and the first one is failure to tend to the business side of the practice. I am, <clears throat> I am working with a law firm right now that is struggling with this issue um, in, in a very big way. And the owner of the firm, there are several attorneys working with the owner, uh, under the owner. Uh, the owner tells me, I am not a managing attorney. I am a practicing attorney. Well, that's the problem. Somebody needs to be a managing attorney in this firm. Somebody needs to take on that responsibility. So failure to tend to the business side of the practice involves things like, you know, intimately understanding your financial numbers and your financial situation, um, making sure that your marketing strategies are working appropriately, making sure that you're staffed properly uh, and that you are as efficient and productive as can be. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of these issues in a moment here, but that's the first one, and that's probably the most common of all, failure to tend to the business side of the practice. You went to law school because you want to practice law. Very few attorneys went to law school with the idea of, boy, I'm going to ace law school, pass the bar, hang out my shingle, and open a business. That wasn't in the picture for most attorneys when they went to law school, that at some point they would be uh, a law firm owner. Now. I don't know who all is on the call here. I think we probably have a lot of small practice attorneys. But there may be attorneys from larger firms as well. 
when I talk about owning your own practice or attending to the business side of the practice, I look at a practice within a large law firm as a separate business. You are still responsible for managing your practice within the confines of a larger firm. You still need to make sure you're working as efficiently and effectively as possible, that you're productive, that you're capturing all of your time, you're making best use of your resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you are in a larger firm, don't think you can slide by on this one. This applies to you as well. All right, behaviors that cause attorneys to under, and the next one, accepting bad clients and cases. If we were sitting in a room together right now, I would ask, how many of you have ever taken a bad case or bad client and you knew it up front? Every hand would go up. Um, and then the next question is, how many of you have ever regretted that? And all those same hands will go up. So accepting bad clients in cases, sometimes that boils down to be what one of my clients told me a few years back is a rent case. I thought he meant landlord-tenant issues. I didn't understand what he was saying when he said a rent case. He said, no, that's a case where your rent is due next week, you don't have the money, and a potential client comes in with a checkbook in hand. You don't care what the case is, you don't care about the client, you need the check. So you take the case on even though you know this isn't somebody you want to work with or it's not an area you're familiar with or whatever. So accepting bad clients in cases certainly cause you to under earn. If you have a bad client, chances are one of the ways they're bad is they're not paying you. Um, and you're going to take a loss on this. You may continue to work and never get paid. You may bail out at some point, but you've already worked and not got paid for it. All right, accepting clients who can't pay. Um, if you are faced with somebody in an initial consultation and it becomes quite clear to you when you start talking about what this case might actually turn out to be cost-wise and they blanch uh, and break into a cold sweat, then that's uh, a red flag right there, that this is beyond their financial means. So if you take them on, what you're basically doing is saying to yourself, I will help this client and I will do this work. I do not expect to be paid. I am all for pro bono work. I love pro bono. I love the fact that attorneys want to do that and help people who are not able to afford legal services. I want to, to just give you this one little proviso here. Absolutely do offer pro bono services as you can but you need to set a limit for yourself every year, either how many hours or how many cases, if you're doing you know, kind of flat fee run of the mill things like a DUI or whatever, how many of those you want to do in a year? What can you afford to take on? The better course here is to refer these clients away to somebody else, either a lower priced attorney or a local county bar referral service or a legal clinic someplace. Help them find legal services that are affordable for them. You are not doing them a favor if you take them on knowing they can't afford you and you bill them and then you start dunning them for unpaid bills and then you end up sending them to collections. You're supposed to be watching out for your client's best interest and I, my opinion only, uh, it is not in your client's best interest to help them run up a bill they can't afford. So. Uh, Curb, curb this behavior. Undervaluing your work. I see this all the time. An attorney will say to me, you know, well, I don't want to really charge much for that because, um, you know, it just didn't take me any time at all. I knocked that letter out in about 15 minutes and I'm not going to charge for that. The thing is, yeah, you knocked the letter out in 15 minutes and you said I'm not going to charge because it didn't take me any time. That letter may have resolved a problem for a client. Um, and the reason it did was because you have years of experience and training that taught you how to write that letter so effectively. So, you know, don't try to value your work from an attorney point of view. Look at the value that you're bringing to your clients. And it just breaks my heart when I see attorneys basically uh, working for free or, you know, charging next to nothing for something 
because they don't understand the value, like the fellow who recorded all of his time. Um, in preparing your bills, you need to consider the value that your work, that you're billing for, has brought to your client. The next one is giving away time. This goes back to the pro bono thing here. But that can also be through the initial consultations that get out of hand, um, free phone calls and, and that sort of thing. Um, not to say that those are never um, appropriate. It's when it's standard practice uh, and it's eating up your time. I, I met an attorney a few months ago at a CLE I did. He came up afterwards and told me that he gets uh, probably 12 to 15 potential client calls every week and he talks to every one of them and he said the problem for me is that a lot of them I can resolve their problem on the phone call and I said well do you charge them and he said well no because they're not clients of mine so he had some work to do there uh, but he was giving away time uh, excessive time failure to market effectively um, I had a call with a client yesterday and um, the office administrator was on the call with us and had come up with a new marketing strategy. Uh, and it's only $300 a month. And um, I listened to what the strategy was, and I've worked with the firm for a year, so I know what the practice is and who their clients are. And I, you know, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? And I said, that, you know, the bottom line is you have to think about who your ideal client is. Who do you want to work with? And how best to get you in front of them? Is this it? And when they stopped to think about it that way, no, it didn't make sense. That's not where their clients were. Um, what they had been doing all along was working for them. This new idea that was only $300 a month, which is a lot of money for a, a solo practice, um, made no sense at all. But the salesperson was very convincing. So failure to market effectively, marketing, knowing who your ideal client is and how best to get in front of them. Next slide, please, Billy. Uh, more behaviors, discounting fees. I'm going to share with you um, some numbers here. This is a, I have a little chart in my book here called The Impact of a Fee Discount. And this tells the percentage of increase in revenues needed to maintain the same gross profit after a discount. So just an idea here, gross margin. If your gross margin is 50%, so 50% of your money is going to overhead, 50% is profit. And you discount your fees by 25. Or I'm sorry, by 10 percent. You need to increase your revenues by 25 percent to maintain the same gross profit that you had before the discount. Now, if it's a one-time thing, you're discounting a fee for a client because the client complained, or well, that's pretty much it. The client complained. You want to preserve the relationship. That's different. I have seen law firms that routinely discount every bill or offer a discount if um, the client will pay within 10 days. They usually do that because they haven't billed for several months and they know they're sending an extra large bill to a client and the client's going to be really unhappy. So they offer this discounted fee. My doctor doesn't do that. Macy's doesn't do that. My veterinarian doesn't do that. My car dealership does not do that. Law firms are the only place that I ever see offering a discount for prompt payment, and I don't understand it. Going back here to the discount, if you discount 15% and your margin is 50%, you have to increase your revenues by 43% to maintain the same level of profitability. So discounting is deadly to a law practice. As I said, there are times when a discount is appropriate. Uh, I will tell you this about discounting. If you have a client who calls and says, you know, I got the bill and it just seems a bit excessive to me. If this is a good client, listen, well, any client, you listen to their reasoning. And if it makes sense, uh, instead of offering a discount, just say, well, what do you think would be a reasonable amount? Uh, and I will tell you why. One of my clients had a, a client call with exactly that. I think this bill's a little excessive and I wanted to talk to you about it. My client, wanting to preserve the relationship, immediately said, well, how about I give you um, a 20% discount? And that was a $6,000 bill. So, you know, 20% was not um, a small amount of money. 
And the a client said, oh, wow, that's great. I was only expecting $200. So now the attorney is locked into giving a much larger discount here, um, giving $1,200 when basically you just gave away $1,000. So if you have an unhappy client and they ask for a discount or you think you need to discount, let them suggest an amount. If it sounds reasonable, go for it. If not, you can counter. You don't have to accept that and say, well, I understand what you're saying. I, you know, I feel that the value of the work was such that instead of doing 25%, I could do 18% or 20%. Uh, all right, not taking an adequate advance fee deposit. I see this a lot. Firms will say, oh, yes, we always take an advance fee deposit. And I'll say every time, yes, every time. And I'll say, so you, you never fail to do that. No, we never fail to do that. Well, on occasion, we don't ask for an advance fee deposit. The advance fee deposit is for two things. One, it's to help make sure you get paid. And two, it's to help make sure that your client is committed to the work that you're doing and is going to follow through. They have some skin in the game here. So taking an adequate advance fee deposit up front is really important. I recommend that you take about the first two months of projected fees up front. Uh, and that way you have a chance to find out who's a deadbeat. If they haven't paid the first bill at the end of the month, and I, by the way, I use replenishing accounts. So you take the advance fee deposit, put it in the trust account, but you don't, you don't withdraw it unless they don't pay their bill. You pay, bill them at the end of the month, uh, and they're responsible for paying the bill even though they have an advance fee deposit in the IOLTA. Um, so it gives you a chance to figure out who the deadbeats are. Codependency, that's putting others' needs ahead of yours. You have clients who are struggling right now, so you say, okay, well then, you know, let's, uh, let's, you don't have to make payments for the next two months here while you get your feet back under you. That's putting other people's needs ahead of yours. That's, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis, that's not what I'm talking about, but there are people who do this all the time. Uh, a few years ago, I went into a bankruptcy firm, and the uh, firm was not making money at all, just way, way struggling. And I started looking at the receivables and talking to the attorney about uh, payment and, and all of this. And at the time, bankruptcies were capped at 895 for um, an individual. And she told me what she would do. She'd spend an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes in the initial consultation. And then the, attorney, or the client would say, well, what's this going to cost me? And she would say $895. And, but she would immediately lean forward and say, but would $25 a month work for you? So she immediately offered them a payment plan without giving them a chance to say, okay, fine, here's a check. Or, you know, I'll send you a check tonight. I have to go home and borrow money from my folks or whatever. So that was codependency. She was putting herself in their shoes. Um, but it was pretty crowded in there because they were already in their shoes. And she might have been looking at different shoes than they were. So uh, you need to watch that. Poor time management skills, wasting time, uh, letting it get away from you, and not doing the productive and billable time first in the day. Procrastinating. If you put off doing a project um, that should have taken you six hours if you had put proper time into it, and you managed to do it in three hours under the gun, um, you've just cut yourself out of three hours of billable time and cut your client out of a better work product because you don't do your best work when you're crashing like that and up against the wire. Um, I learned this from uh, an attorney a few years ago who would just race around uh, like crazy and everybody jumping through hoops trying to get things out the door. These were things that he had known for months were due on a specific date. And there'd be a messenger in the lobby waiting and uh, you know, jump in the car and take off for court. And everybody was just going crazy. And he would talk to me about how, you know, they really pulled it out of the fire. We got this out the door in an hour and a half. And I watched him. He never reviewed the documents when they were prepared. He would just sign them and send them out the door. And I said, you know, isn't that dangerous? You're not even looking them over. He said, no time, no time. We've got to get this out the door. And I said, well, what if there are mistakes in there? You know, you've committed yourself or your client to something that isn't correct. And he said, well, then we'll file an amendment. Uh, we'll do an amendment. No. Uh, I asked him one time how long that project would have taken him. 
had he done it properly. And it was many more hours than they had put in. And, uh, and the client would have been well served. And the client was not well served when he was doing it that way. Disorganization, the same thing. American Association of, um, it's the National Association of Professional Organizers, says that American executives, and that would be you, lose about 180 hours a year looking for things. So you think, OK, if even half of that's in the office, 90 hours a year at your billable rate, how much money are you losing every year because you're disorganized? Hire a professional organizer. Have them come in, assess how you work in your workspace, where you need things to be, and help you get set up. And then not working enough hours. Sometimes it's as simple as that. Um, you may be in the, hour, in the office eight hours, but you look at the end of the day, you've got only an hour and a half of time recorded. So in the hand out materials, I've given you many, many, many more uh, behaviors that cause under-earning here. But let's look at the next slide here and determine or take a look at how under-earning affects others. Your under-earning uh, can keep your partners or the firm owners from earning more. It deprives your family of a lifestyle that could offer the activities, opportunities, and level of comfort that you would all enjoy. It restricts the growth of your practice. It affects your ability to represent your clients to the best of your ability because you don't have the money to invest in the resources like technology and staff and experts uh, that would aid in representation. It keeps you from being truly competitive in an increasingly competitive marketplace. You end up working harder than you have to in order to reach your goals. Your advancement in your firm may be hampered because you aren't seen as carrying your share of the load. Uh, under earning uh, undermines your self-esteem and may even make you question your career choice. It saddles you with constant worry about money that can distract you from your work. It causes you stress, which can endanger your health by causing depression, anxiety, sleeplessness, and over or under eating. And you may feel guilt about not making as much money as you could. Uh, so many, the, the impact, the ripples from your under earning are far reaching. Next slide, Billy, please. Whose needs are more important, your clients' needs or your needs, your family's needs, your partner's or employee's needs, your other clients' needs? Uh, next slide, please, Billy. So the first thing you need to ask yourself here is how much is enough? What do you need to earn to cover your overhead and your compensation? Uh, and how many hours do you need to work to achieve this? Now, you have to know your realization rate to know how many hours you need to work. Your realization rate uh, is the percentage of fees billed that you actually collect. So you say, OK, I need to, to um, earn to cover overhead and compensation. I need to earn uh, $180,000 this year. So I uh, bill it $200 an hour. So I need to bill 900 hours here. Um, no, if your realization rate is 50%, you need to bill 100, uh, 1,800 hours because you're only collecting half of what you bill. Uh, and then you need to know if your billing rate is adequate to help you meet this goal. So the first thing is to get clear on how much is enough. Out of the money fog, in the reality here, and using real numbers. Next slide, please, Billy. There's some far, uh, smart financial management tools that you need to rely on in your practice, the realization rate, which we just talked about, your hourly rate calculation, um, revenues goals, how much you need to earn, your profit and loss statement. You need to be looking at that on a regular basis. And um, in a small firm, your um, overhead should not be more than about 40 to 45 percent of your revenues. Uh, not including attorney compensation, just straight overhead, rent, insurance, staff, that sort of thing. Regularly review the profit and loss statement for that kind of information. Your age to counts report. You don't want to let things get more than about 60 days past due at the most. Uh, if you use a replenishing trust account um, where you hold the money in trust and you bill uh, monthly and they pay that bill and the money still sits in the trust account, you'll have no receivables. Uh, and wouldn't that be lovely? There's a productivity dashboard tool uh, that I love. Um, and I don't remember if that's in the handout materials or not. If it's not and you would like a copy of that, shoot me an email and I will send it to you. It's very self-explanatory. And you need to know your liquidity ratios. You need to understand what it, your uh, ability would be to 
raise money in times of an emergency. Like my friend Mark, whose office was red tagged after an earthquake, and he had to come up with new office space, new equipment, uh, get his staff back to work, uh, and get set back up in about three or four days. Um, he needed to know, and he had, good liquidity ratios, the ability to raise money quickly, and the ability to cover his uh, everyday operating expenses. All right, next slide, please, Billy. So let's take a look then at the seven secrets to healthy earning here. The first one is uh, acknowledge and commit to change. Now, if, you've, if you're still on the call, it's because something you heard along the way here has told you flat out you're under earning. And uh, that's acknowledgment. And now you're going to commit to change that. You're going to commit to alter these behaviors and replace them with healthy ones that will help you earn what you deserve and, um, and what you need. So that would be the first here. The second one is identify how you under earn and pinpoint the specific trouble spots. Uh, and then label each one either active or passive under earning. And with each of these trouble spots, you need to ask yourself, what is it about this action or inaction that causes me to under earn? What do I get out of it and what's the payoff? And then you pick the under-earning action or any action that has the biggest impact on your earnings right now and build a plan to change that behavior. The best thing you can do for yourself here is to get an accountability partner. It's someone in whom you have a lot of trust. It cannot be a family member. And it cannot be a business partner. It has to be somebody who does not have a vested interest in you making more money because that's going to change the dynamic here. And there's that's not going to be productive for you. So find a colleague, somebody that you trust and you can uh, turn to as an accountability partner. Schedule regular check-ins to make sure you're staying on track and actively working to change under handy, I'm sorry, under earning behavior into positive behavior. What you do with each of your meetings is you state a goal that you want to accomplish between now and your next meeting. And you lay out how you're going to do that. And you commit to that. You know, we're going to talk again in two weeks. And by then, I will have, you know, reviewed my billing rate and changed it accordingly. Whatever, you know, whatever you need to do here. So that when you meet again, that's where the accountability comes in, knowing that there's something specific you have to report on. That's the probably the most valuable part of the work I do with my clients is the accountability. They have homework after every one of our calls. And they know in the next call, they're going to report in on what they did with the homework. So set that up. Number three, set personal achievement goals and develop a plan to reach those goals. For example, if you want to earn $100,000 this year, you've got to think about how you'll do that. What will it take for you to reach your goal? And then share those goals with an accountability partner, the bigger goals and then the short-term goals. And then reward yourself when you achieve a goal. Not, I'm not talking about the big $100,000 one here. Yes, you could do that and take a weekend in Paris. But the, the little goals along the way, like I'm going to revamp my billing um, rate. I'm going to uh, develop a new marketing plan. Whatever. Give yourself little rewards along the way so that there's um, some encouragement for you, there's some, some payoff here. Then number four, set a daily goal for yourself each day at work. And among other things, you need to plan your work day and protect your work time. Uh, record all of your time contemporaneously. If you wait to the end of the day to record your time, you're going to lose 10 to 15% of potential billable time because you simply don't remember. If you wait to the next day, it's about 25%. Uh, and if you wait to the end of the week, it's about 50%. So if your timekeeping is a problem, get a kitchen timer, set it 15 minutes, every 15 minutes. It will interrupt you. It will be a pain in the neck. But you're going to stop and say, okay, did I remember to start my timer here? Did I note my start time on this project? Did I write down the end time on the last project that I finished after the last buzzer? Uh, so work on developing the habit of recording time contemporaneously. One of the best ways to do that is to take what I call my 30-day challenge, and that's where you write down every single thing you do, uh, regardless of whether or not it's billable. And I will tell you now, you will not get every single thing you did every single day for 30 days, but you'll get a pretty good feel for where your time is going. And you need to really assess that as to whether or not you're making best use of your time, 
are doing too much non-billable work that should be delegated to somebody else. All right, so record your time contemporaneously. Eliminate your time wasters. If you read the newspaper when you come into the office, read it at home in the morning over breakfast. Um, if you spend a lot of time internet surfing, uh, limit that to lunchtime or evening hours. Um, and then get plenty of rest. And then periodically throughout the day, ask yourself, what's the best use of my time right now? And adjust your work plan accordingly. Um, that's a good one. I use that one all the time. What's the best use of my time right now? Sometimes I finish a task, I'm not sure, quite sure what to start next. And instead of going to my list, which I should, and by the way, I keep a to-do list that only has three to four items a day. I call those from my master list because working from a master list was overwhelming and I was feeling defeated at the end of every day for all I did not get done. So now I take three or four things off, put it on a post at the corner of my monitor and work until those are done and then I go back to my master list and choose more things. And then I feel a sense of accomplishment and I know I've gotten done the things that absolutely had to be done today. All right, number five, pay attention to your business. Become a proactive manager rather than reactive. Plan things out, think ahead. Uh, get a goal, get a vision for your firm. Don't wait for circumstances to hit you. You know, when the downturn hit us in 2008-2009, uh, most law firms were not ready for that. Um, and they didn't know what to do. They had to be reactive and they didn't know how to do that. Uh, I knew an attorney at the time who had been proactive. He realized he couldn't rely on having all of his eggs in one basket. He family law. He had attorneys working for him. Um, and they were doing traditional family law, you know. Uh, spouse versus spouse, end up in court, division of the property, and that's it. He started looking around and uh, hit upon the idea of doing unbundled services for pro se clients. And when the economy took a nosedive, family law took a big hit because people couldn't afford to divorce and couldn't afford to support two households and the houses they had had were underwater and they weren't going to get any money out of them and and all of this. His pro se business took off and that's what got him through that period. He had been proactive and planned with no thought at all that this economic crisis was coming, but just planned uh, that he needed to do something more with his business so that he wasn't so dependent on just what income stream. All right, know your realization rate. It should be 90% or higher. The lowest I've ever seen was um, uh, 43%. That means 43 cents of every dollar came to the firm, and 57 cents of every dollar never made it through the door. Don't let your ARs get old, get beyond 60 days. Review your billing rate once a year. Uh, develop a budget for your practice, and then figure out what you need to do each day to meet that budget. Uh, know how much time you spend in your initial consultations. That goes back to the timekeeping here. Keep a time log of all your time, billable and non-billable, hourly, flat fee, contingent, doesn't matter, all of your time. Bill promptly, accurately, and in detail. Get better at case and client selection. Learn to say no. If something doesn't feel right, you see red flags, say no. I have never, ever heard an attorney say, gee, I really regret turning away that client. I have heard every attorney I've ever known say, gee, I really regret taking that client when I saw red flags. I limit your pro bono work and make a plan for your practice to guide your business decisions. If you have a business plan, you go back to that with every business decision you make, and that's going to help you stay on track and keep from wasting time and money. Number six, spend time every day marketing. Focus on attracting your ideal client, Put your time and money into the marketing strategies that provide you with the best return on investment. Step outside of your comfort zone to get new results and try new ideas. Um, there's so much you can do in the way of marketing that doesn't cost a lot. Uh, certainly now with social media and you know, if nothing else, put up a Facebook page and uh, and work that. So. Pay attention to the marketing here and make sure that you're bringing in the right kind of clients and clients who can afford you. And then number seven, delegate the tasks you shouldn't be doing. That would include bookkeeping, um, clerical work, uh, designing and updating your website. We now have virtual employees. You don't need to have somebody on-premises for 40 hours a week. You use them only for the time they actually work. 
So the things that are not billable are the things that you should not be doing. And you would delegate those away. Billing, next slide, please. <coughs> and bonus number eight here. Uh, to jumpstart your new earning behaviors here, make it a goal to bill 15 minutes more per day. If you have the work, you have the clients, just make a conscious choice um, that you're going to bill 15 minutes more. Maybe you know it's 25 to 12, and you think, no point starting a new project because I'm going to go lunch in 25 minutes. No. Say, I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes getting started on the next project. You know, Maybe I need to pull a file, I need to review a document, or whatever consciously make decisions about how you're going to spend your time and you will find 15 minutes more every day and if you do that and you bill say at $200 an hour that can add 11,000 plus to your bottom line this next year so uh, definitely worthwhile um, just making those choices I'm not talking about stretching a project and taking advantage of clients to get the 15 minutes it has to be that you actually have work there um, and you're you're not fabricating work but you'd be amazed at the, the difference that will make. So you might uh, add the 15 minutes by getting better organized, stop procrastinating on a billable task in favor of some non-revenue producing task, uh, using your mobile devices outside of the office to handle billable tasks, your tablets or your smartphones, uh, delegate updating your contacts list to somebody else, let somebody else open the mail, uh, eliminate your biggest time waster. So all things that can help you get 15 minutes more. I'm going to end here, and then we'll take a couple of questions. But um, some years ago, I was doing, I mentioned I, I do a monthly class on improving your business. Um, and there was an attorney in one of my classes, and this was one of the live ones where we were actually meeting all face-to-face. -face. She just moved to the area, and... She just really dug in. Uh, she'd come from a nonprofit background. This was the first time she'd had her own practice or been in private practice. But she really dug in. She did everything right for marketing. And I was so in awe of her. And I thought, this is great. She has no background in this, but she just instinctively knows what to do, and she's making it work for her. Well, about a year after the class ended, she called me one day and said, I think I need to work with you. And uh, I said, sure, what, what do you need? And she started telling me that she wasn't making any money. She'd been in business on her own now for 18 months. Um, she had taken uh, only about $2,000 out of the business in 18 months. Um, she had clients coming in. Uh, she had a, a legal assistant. She had an office. But she just had no money. And she was getting panicky and didn't know what to do. And So I met with her. And we talked for three hours. I was astounded by the story she told me. Uh, it turned out in 18 months she had never once billed a client. And I asked her why that was. And she said, well, it's not me. It's not for lack of wanting. But uh, her legal assistant by name, she called her by name, uh, refuses to to prepare bills because she thinks when our clients have given us money up front, given that their situation, uh, they have paid enough. And I was dumbfounded that I'm sitting here listening to an attorney tell me that her legal assistant is calling the shots in the office and is saying, we're not going to be billing clients for your legal services. Um, and I, what was going through my head was, first, that legal assistant is out of here right now. Um, and two, then we're, we're going to turn this around here. So I asked her what she was living on, and she said, advanced fee deposits. Uh, so again, we spent three hours, and I, I asked her, you know, what do you need to take out of your business? And her uh, significant other was with us in this meeting and uh, had said nothing the whole day. Uh, and uh, the attorney thought for a moment. She said, I would really like to take $1,000 out of my business a month. That's 12000 a year. And you think about your lifestyle and your home and your commitments and all that. Could you live on 12000 and I saw the partner's jaw lock up. And I said, is $1,000 a month enough? Would that be enough to contribute to the home pot? She said, well, I'd really like to take 2000 but there's simply no way I could ever do that. And I, I, I was floored that her goal was so small. And even doubling that to 2000 a month, she just thought was impossible. So again, we spent three hours. I, I, 
pulled out everything I could think of for her. I I just gave her every tool I could think of and went away and didn't hear from her. And about a year later, she called me, and she sounded entirely different. And I, she said, I think I need to work with you. And I was stunned. She was still in business. And I, I said, tell me, catch me up. What's going on? And she said, well, um, she said that, that meeting with you was a turning point. Uh, I now have two attorneys working with me. I have a legal assistant and a paralegal, and we have all the business we can handle. I am taking money out of my practice every month, uh, and we're doing just great. I need to grow the business a little bit more, and I'm not sure how to do this. And um, I said, I am floored. I am so thrilled with your success story here. And she said, well, you gave me four words that just turned my life around. It was the best four words I'd ever heard. And I thought out of three hours, she only got four words out of this, but okay. And I said, what did I say? And she said, build clients, get money. Uh, and she said, it sounded so simple, but uh, she said, when I started treating this like a business, it became a business. So I leave you with that. Uh, there was a happy ending to the story from somebody who was just, I just didn't think she would make it to the end of the month when I met with her. But she dug in, did the work, changed the way she was doing things, and <clears throat> started treating this like a business and went on to build a lovely practice, which actually got incorporated into a larger firm uh, about two years later. And she is now a partner in that firm and loves it. So there is hope. I wish you all luck with that. Uh, I know we're a couple minutes over. Billy, I don't know if there were any questions that came up. If there are questions that we don't get to, please email me and I will happily answer any of them. Great. Thanks, Ann. And uh, everyone on the line, um, we've got the contact information slide up now. So as Ann mentioned, feel free to reach out to her oh, directly. You, yeah. um, the, the other bit of information is as you exit the webinar today, uh, a brief survey will appear. It's only three questions. And we certainly appreciate in advance you taking just a few minutes to let us know uh, how we did today. Uh, so, Ann, we did have a couple of questions come in, and if you're okay with it, uh, we still have some folks that are on the line, and I thought we could go ahead and, and address them, if you don't mind. You bet. Nope, you bet. Uh, so the first one I uh, wanted to get into was um, the individual has decided to focus on a new area of law, so definitely uh, not feeling worth uh, their fee yet. So when they're getting up to speed, should they, you know, they want to record their time, should they record that in a way that is not visible? on the bill to the client, or re rather than showing the client that I spent time and did not bill for it? Um, it an excellent question here. Uh, when you are getting up to speed in a new practice area, you're probably not charging what other people in that practice area with a lot of experience are charging. So I wouldn't be so concerned about trying to um, under bill or not bill for all my time. Now, if you are lockstepping your rate with somebody else who's got you know 10 or 15 or 20 years of experience in that practice area, then you may you may want to uh, not bill for everything and and not you know charge your clients for your learning curve. But that's why associate attorneys have lower rates because they take longer to do things. Um, they have the learning curve, and the client shouldn't be paying premium dollar for that. But I don't know exactly what your situation is here. So bottom line is if you are charging less than other people in that practice area um, with a lot of experience, I wouldn't worry about um, trying to undercut myself in that. If you are more, your billing rate is more in line with what other people with a lot of experience are charging, then I still would record all of the time. And then I don't know what kind of a time and billing program you're using, but at the time that you're preparing the bills, <clears throat> if you want to um, you know, write down that time, you can do that before the bill is actually finalized and goes out to the client. So you, you would know what you billed, and, and I need you to know what you actually worked, whether or not you bill that time. Because as you get better and more familiar with the work, that's going to uh, reduce. You're going to spend less time doing research and uh, drafting and redrafting and all. The other thing though, is you need to get a really good mentor in this new practice area, because that's going to save you a lot of fumbling around. Uh, find somebody who can answer questions for you and give you guidance and share forms and all of that. All right, 
What else? Uh, other question, Ann, is do you have any information on collecting from clients without turning them into collections? Um, well, it starts, your collections process starts in your initial consultation. It starts in your fee agreement where you tell them what your expectations are of payment and when you bill and what your billing rate is and who you're going to be billing for and what happens if they don't pay. So that's, that's the beginning of your collections policy. Beyond that, you need to have a policy in place that, uh, you know, I'm just going to throw out an example here. This is not meant to be your guideline, but let's say that you, in your fee agreement, it says that, you know, we'll bill you and you have to pay us within 10 days or 15 days. Let's say 15 days. And if we haven't received payment in 15 days, then it's considered past due. Uh, typically, you wouldn't add an interest rate until it's 30 days past due. But um, so you give them, you know, the 15 days. If they haven't paid, you need to take action immediately. Uh, give them a phone call right away and say, just go through our receivables here, realize we haven't received your payment yet. Is there anything that we can help you with? Is there anything going on we need to know about? Uh, and you listen, you know, maybe they started a new job and they got sick and they missed a week of pay and they simply don't have the money. Well, you offer a solution. Then would it be helpful if we divided this payment into two? Could you pay half this week and half next week or half the week after or whatever? But the, the key to collections is to tackle them immediately as soon as they become past due. Don't let them get 60 and 90 and 120 days old because for every passing day, your chance of 100% recovery drops. Um, the other thing is the replenishing deposit, taking that money up front, your advanced fee deposit, but then not withdrawing that as you go along. Towards the end of the matter, that's when you start sending bills that say don't pay, and you start consuming what's in the trust account. But if you have that money in the trust account, that's your safeguard against not getting paid. Uh, if you're using a traditional uh, advanced fee deposit or retainer, as some people call it, where you're billing against it, when that runs out, then it's up to you to try to get more money out of a client and they may not be interested in giving you any more money. So start with educating your clients right up front about money and their obligation. They have signed this, account, this agreement with you that says, I understand what you're going to charge and I am assuming financial responsibility for that. Um, and then, you know, the, if you want to want, avoid collections, um, if the client has a problem with your billing, then you might want to look at, you know, doing a fee arbitration or something like that. But I just prefer that you set the policies in place so that you don't ever get into that position. Great. Anything else? I think that's all for today. Um, okay. If we didn't uh, get a chance to address your question or if you have additional questions, again, feel free to reach out uh, directly to, to Anne uh, at her content information listed on the slide. And again, um, would appreciate you taking a few moments to fill out the survey that will automatically appear as you exit out of today's webinar. But I uh, wanted to obviously thank all of you for joining us today. And Anne, thank you for a terrific presentation. Hope to uh, have all of you back to join us for a future LexisNexis webinar. But otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day, and thanks again for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.